So yesterday we had a fantastic set of uh, discussions and I think it was a really great brainstorming day. And so I wanted to at least start the day by synthesizing or attempting to synthesize, I'm sure I missed a lot of things, um, uh, many of the ideas that started to emerge yesterday in an attempt that we might today begin to take some of those to develop you know, concrete actions or if not like long-term plans, at least pilot activities that we could really come away with um, enthusiasm and energy for that would move the ball ahead for the whole field and community that we're trying to lead and serve. Um, and I'm following along the, the three working groups because most of our discussions um, came from this, these three areas and wanted to highlight and repeat some of the things that we heard from the synthesis of the discussion that um, Carl and Nelson and Mark led in the late afternoon and particularly point to some things that we might begin to think about how we act on today. And so I hope today we will, um, or at least a lot of the time today, we'll begin to think about and map out some specific actions that maybe some of the things that I list here, maybe others that I've you know, overlooked listing. Um, in the disease consortium discussion, I think there was clearly a focus um, throughout on uh, first and foremost, ensuring that we had standards, formats, and a location to consistently share summary statistics from the world's largest genome-wide association studies. I think we are doing perhaps a little bit better than we might have you know, described in terms of our ability to get the newest, latest meta-analysis from you know, good thinking collaborative consortia, but I think there's a lot more that we can do, obviously, in that, in that vein. Um, Great opportunities, I think, as we begin especially to diversify the ancestries of our population and diversify the phenotypes that we study across disease consortia and biobanks to really dig into methods and, again, standards and take advantage of opportunities in the fine mapping and co-localization. I think we've heard then in the V2F section and really throughout the day the importance that we get all hands on deck not only to get the genetic data into a place where people can use it and operate on it, but to really advance our methodologies and advance the diversity and, and ancestry of our genotypes and phenotypes. Um, some discussion, though not a great deal, um, surrounded rare variant analyses and meta-analyses. And I think there are opportunities that we're only just starting to probe with respect to meta-analysis and some unique analytic challenges that I don't think we've taken on there necessarily. And here especially, we are really, as in the case of the fine mapping, using to date only a small fraction of the world's history of mutation and recombination. And so not simply for ethical reasons, but also for scientific ones, we need to make a point of increasing diversity in our samples and studies. And then finally, I think there's a great deal of interest in expanding what disease consortia do, moving into understanding disease progression phenotypes and response to therapies. And these are areas where we haven't made you know, as much progress, you know, in large part because there's greater challenges to acquiring, harmonizing, and understanding the phenotype data. Biobanks had a similarly interesting and exciting group of uh, sets of discussions, um, and again, leaning heavily on, on understanding and increasing the diversity, not only of our biobank participants, but also the scientists and the leadership of this consortium in terms of moving ahead in truly global fashion. Um, there is clearly a great importance to having a globally represented sample with respect to biobanks that can be recalled by genotype, phenotype, many other reasons, and I think we should pay particular attention to developing those resources because all of our downstream activities, whether they are variant to function of a particularly unique variant in a particular part of the world or whether they are globally using genetic information to advance um, follow-up testing, clinical trials, and so forth, require this. Um, and then here also, longitudinal phenotypes with a slightly different spin on them, obviously trying to figure out and think about something which we can begin today possibly, what are the designs that will really lead us to 
novel insights with respect to biobanks that then follow up individuals over hopefully reasonably long periods of time, but really any follow up period of time would give us substantive advances in the types of phenotypes and the types of understanding that we can gain. Um, and so I think we could think even if we can't immediately go out and launch you know, a whole bunch of these things, what are the types of designs and the parameters that will really advance some of the questions that we want to get into, such as prediction and the identification of pre-disease biomarkers. So there was also some discussion in the afternoon, and Nelson brought this up, of course, you know, are we doing enough with the existing data that we have? And as we already have represented in this room and elsewhere, quite a number of biobank studies that have considerable, considerable amounts of genotype data already collected, we should be thinking about, to some extent, um, how do we and what do we learn from biobank meta-analysis? And with a particular focus on this consortium activity, um, there was a good discussion about whether or not um, and how we could derive large-scale phenotypes from biobanks and compare and contrast those with clinical gold standard phenotypes. And I know there's a lot of opinions, and there always have been and always will be probably, about, about how those two things align to each other. But we have genetic instruments now that can tell us that this and this definition either is good enough or it clearly is not good enough, and we should start using those and think about strategies for using those instruments more and more routinely. And then moving into more complicated instruments, such as polygenic risk scores, which are challenged not only by transferability of phenotype definition, but also transferability of genetic variation patterns across populations, we really need to, before we get deeply into thinking about how we use these clinically, address the fact that they do not transfer, translate perhaps evenly across all ancestries and what we need to do to build resources so that we can amend that. Um, thinking about, there was good discussion in the biobank section, clinical impact and relevance to healthcare providers and as a testing ground for future uses of genetics in the clinic, are there activities that across biobanks we could think about taking on with respect to prediction and using polygenic risk scores to predict individuals with later outcomes, be they cardiovascular, cancer, who knows what. And I think we also began to have some discussions about looking at polygenic risk extremes with respect to both human physiology and with respect to cellular exploration. And so thinking about each of those and how we might advance those types of things, drawing samples and or cells from our biobanks at the extreme tails of these would be, I think, quite informative. And again, the type of thing that large numbers and diversity that can only be brought by a global consortium will have unique opportunities to pursue. Um, and I wanted to you know, pause and come back to the idea that should we think about, as a concrete action, potentially trying to seed or initiate or push forward a, you know, a relatively straightforward multi-biobank meta-analysis pilot such as Nelson began presenting a few slides from. And some of the advantages, I'll just give one example of why we might be interested to do that and what can start to emerge from it. I think they are pretty obvious to most geneticists, but it's worth thinking through whether there are specific opportunities, particularly with respect to fine mapping and getting to insights about variant to function that can be derived from this. So one of the examples, just as a sort of this you know, demonstration type project we selected to look at was primary open angle glaucoma, again, a phenotype that's been well studied by GWAS, so these are not new findings and so forth. But one particularly useful example sort of highlights why diversity in population um, studies can be of great advantage. So in this particular case, there was a very strong association to this particular region on chromosome one, largely driven by a strongly Finnish enriched allele. So we have one form of diversity in various isolated populations that can bring novel insights. Now this, of course, being a common you know, haplotype in Finland and rare everywhere else, has extended linkage to sequilibrium and doesn't pinpoint any particular variant precisely. These variant patterns in this region are much rarer in the UK biobank and elsewhere, but 
there's modest association but greatly reduced linkage to equilibrium such that when you put together the full combination, you start to pinpoint specific variants very nicely. Now that's pretty simple. What makes this one a little bit more interesting is that with a truncating um, variant near the end of the gene, there's not certainty immediately of what the interpretation of this is. As it turns out, um, this being a very strong risk factor for glaucoma, one is drawn using the NOMAD resources to look and flag that there's one particular other variant that actually happens to have a reasonably high frequency. It's a very early truncation variant and so much more assuredly a loss of function variant and has been previously reported, however, in a single case in a letter to the editor in 1999 that this was also a pathogenic and it's been listed in ClinVar as a pathogenic variant since then, but with the diversity that comes from having Biobank Japan involved in these analyses with our colleague Yuki, they were able to look very quickly and see that there's absolutely no association whatsoever. This is actually a common and totally benign variant in MyOC. And so with the information from multiple diverse biobanks and what you can very easily see from the NOMAD resource that we'll probably hear a little bit more about today, you can put together a story that not only involves fine mapping, but really lends fundamental insight into the mechanism of action of variation in this gene. Because this early truncating variant, which is most assuredly loss of function, is benign. The late one is then suspected to, and there's quite a bit of evidence to this effect, is a more toxic gain of function protein aggregation type of scenario. And so this is, I think, why in the long term, disease consortia and diverse biobanks really need to work together to build these types of insights. Um, there's obviously quite a number of other things that disease consortia and biobanks can do together. I think um, uh, Nancy described this very eloquently that what we are all trying to do really is build an atlas of disease and phenotype. And this requires obviously both the depth of samples and detail and disease and the breadth of phenotype and diversity that can be brought from biobanks. Biobank meta-analyses such as the one that I described could eventually start to make contributions to those disease consortia, but this of course requires that gold standard variant testing of equivalence of phenotype. And then finally, I think tackling longitudinal phenotypes is clearly of interest to both groups and there's a good discussion point to be had about um, what can be learned from full biobank studies with respect to incidence and pre-disease biomarkers versus ascertained case clinic, case control samples from clinics where we need to study progression and response. And can you harmonize those and what can they learn together? And then finally, I liked, you know, the way that Robert sort of introduces and puts variant to function activities in the middle of a progression between understanding the genetics of disease and understanding the full range of phenotypes that result that you can see from biobanks. And this is really, I think, for many of us, um, a vision that we've had for quite some time that the goal of human genetics and trying to understand the genetics of disease is really to get to these types of detailed understandings about the mechanism of or the allelic series at each gene. But this, of course, I think we saw plenty of examples where this has to be done in the very specific context of the disease and the very specific cells of disease, it may not be something that's so easily and generically done for all cells in one fell swoop. And I think we got that message from the V2F discussion groups that Mark very nicely summarized with um, this simple looking but quite profoundly large um, and, and probably not even complete set of opportunities that when you think about it, um, you, you start to do the math and multiply through um, individuals, variations, cells, states, and a variety of readouts. And even if you restrict those readouts to very simple omics type readouts, this is still an enormous amount of work and still doesn't necessarily recapitulate the very specific um, insights that are often required digging into cells, pathways, processes, and biochemistry that really get to some of the hard-earned examples that we saw yesterday. I think there is great potential, and I was very excited that, that you know, with what Romnick was describing in terms of um, moving from what used to take quite a long time to a slightly 
you know, a, a considerably reduced, streamlined, and also um, likely, you know, having greater opportunities for, um, you know, uh, scaling up in a way that, that obviously mouse models have not traditionally had. Um, and I think some of the discussion points, I guess, with respect to, to variant to function activities that I think we need to be thinking about and starting to, to push on today, this is just a, a small, you know, set of snippets from that. Um, you could think of the massive dimensional hypercube that Mark was describing and are the, asking then are there some broad generic activities that might make sense for us to think about with respect to broadly providing a baseline of information that could be used in many, many scenarios. Um, we really do have to think also not about necessarily just everything as, as simple types of omics experiments, but obviously the ultimate um, answer often rests in um, biological or biochemistry or immunologic readouts and how do we systematically start to collect and utilize that data in this similar type of context. And there's a variety of other questions that at least I still have with respect to what we can learn from many of the hard earned success stories that were described yesterday. And do we even have a clear definition of what defines success in variant to function or genetic discovery all the way through to a clear and conclusive understanding of function? And maybe as a starting point, we could, we could simply try to come away with a common understanding and definition for some of the, you know, in the similar vein to what we were discussing with the um, genetic uh, consortia in the biobanks, a common set of standards and methods for defining things like success in variant to function space. Um, and then as a last point, I think we need to obviously come away today starting to think about specific working groups that can take on some of these specific actions. And I think we had a small discussion after wrapping up the meeting yesterday. There are probably at least five. There are possibly more. There could be some discussion, um, at least a few people have raised, should disease consortia and biobanks be separate? At least in my mind, I think they have such, you know, complementary but distinct activities that I think it makes sense, but that's certainly something that could be discussed. And I think the last one with respect to data sharing and ethics, we like the idea of perhaps combining these ideas such that ethics is not always and simply a discussion about data protection, but also balancing that with the importance and recognition of the opportunities that are overlooked if you don't share data. Um, and I think we have the UK Biobank here as a great example, and I will turn it over to Rory in a moment. And there are plenty of examples that, um, as Nancy eloquently put it, um, in which data sharing, you know, the groups have not been as proactive, and, and I sort of like that turn of phrase, so I include it here for everyone to enjoy. So thank you, and I hope that we can have a really great and productive discussion and take some of these things into real action. Mm -hmm.